This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Anjali Comet. We're talking about the atomic age 64 years ago this weekend, on August 6 and August 9, 1945. The atomic bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki by the U.S. military, thus launching the nuclear age. For more on this, we're joined now by three guests. Pervez Hoodboy, nuclear physicist and disarmament activist, chair of the physics department at the Kaidi Azam University in Islam. Lombard, joining us from Washington, D.C. Here in our firehouse studio is Frida Berrigan, longtime peace activist, senior program associate of the Arms and Security Initiative at the New America Foundation. Previously, she served for eight years at the Arms Trade Resource Center at the World Policy Institute. Her latest article appears at Tom Dispatch. It's called, For the 64th Time, No More Nuclear War. And joining us via Democracy Now! video stream from California, Daniel Ellsberg, the whistleblower who leaked the Pentagon Papers that exposed the true story behind the U.S. decision um, making in the Vietnam War. Over the next year, he plans to release segments of his memoir in order to reveal the true history of the American nuclear era. The first part appears at Truthdig uh, and his website uh, last week called Hiroshima Day. America has been asleep at the wheel for 64 years. Daniel Berrigan, let's begin with you. Um, why focus on nuclear issues uh, on this memoir that you're releasing as an internet book over the next year? Daniel, Daniel Ellsberg, sorry. <laughs> we have Frida here, so I can't stop thinking about her uncle. Uh, Daniel Ellsberg, um, why focus on the nuclear age? Uh, you're well known for releasing the Pentagon Papers about the history of Vietnam. I worked on, I worked on, I worked on nuclear plant before I worked on Vietnam. In fact, I started working on Vietnam in a lot of getting away from planning for deaths to a more human side. Daniel, we're going to come back to you in a minute because we're going to correct the sound. Um, uh, but let's turn to Frida Berrigan um, and your piece uh, uh, that is now out and your work on nuclear issues. Where do we stand today? Well, we stand at a, at a precipice. Um, we stand at this uh, very interesting and dangerous uh, place. Um, uh, we heard at the top of this uh, story about um, Obama's promise uh, to the world, this commitment uh, to seek uh, peace and security through a world free of nuclear weapons. Um, and that's a very serious commitment, and steps have been made uh, by his administration uh, to move us in that direction. But they're small steps, um, and they happen in the context of essentially uh, ignorance uh, on the part of the American people about uh, nuclear issues, about nuclear dangers. Um, and uh, and so it's sort of happening at this elite level um, where Henry Kissinger and Sam Nunn and William Perry are interested in nuclear weapons. Uh, but the American people as a whole are uh, distracted and um, basically have no awareness of, of what happened 64 years ago and what continues um, uh, to threaten the world, these 27,000 nuclear weapons that are in the possession of the nine nuclear powers, uh, the nuclear weapons that the United States has, the $6 billion that we spend on an annual basis on uh, nuclear weapons research and development. All of these things are, are sort of happening outside of the consciousness of the American people, which is why it's so important to remember Hiroshima to remember Nagasaki um, and to uh, really push the administration um, to follow through on these commitments um, because uh, nuclear weapons are not going to disarm themselves. Frida Berrigan, in your article on Tom Dispatch, you talk about um, how the U.S. is pursuing a lead and hedge policy. Can you explain what you mean by that? Sure. Um, well, uh, within this uh, context of a, a promise to disarm, uh, the United States um, is very invested in continuing to be uh, predominant uh, and to continue uh, to uh, hold on uh, to the ability to destroy the world many times over. Um, and so as we cut, um, and there are cuts that are being negotiated with the Russians, um, we, it's sort of this one step forward, two steps back um, dynamic where we'll cut up until a certain point, but um, uh, we'll lead in that way, uh, but we'll maintain this hedge. Um, so when uh, the Bush administration uh, negotiated cuts um, in 2001, um, uh, 
we really wanted uh, to see those weapons dismantled, um, and yet they were just taken offline. They could be reconnected. Um, you know, it would be very straightforward to reconnect them. Uh, those weapons were not destroyed. Uh, they were just taken offline. Um, so now, as uh, the Obama administration is making this commitment, there really needs to be a lot of attention paid to what happens to those weapons once they're taken offline. Are they just sort of on the, on the shelf uh, that we can uh, put them back into rotation right away, or are they destroyed? Are they dismantled? Um, and so that's a, a critical piece of the puzzle at this point. Frida, this, the nuclear age has been the context of your life, perhaps more than many people. Talk a little about your family's history. Um, I was uh, calling Dan Ellsberg, Dan Berrigan, your uncle, but talk about your family. Sure. Well, I really feel as though I um, was born uh, under a mushroom cloud, in, in a sense. Uh, we were so aware, as little children, um, of the dangers of nuclear weapons. I write in the Tom Dispatch piece uh, that we would watch movies about Hiroshima and Nagasaki on the wall of our living room. Um, and uh, we learned about uh, Sadako, a little girl in Hiroshima who was um, uh, found to be sick with atomic bomb sickness as a nine-year-old who died of leukemia um, and who, uh, on her sickbed, uh, folded more than 600 paper cranes uh, trying to fulfill this, um, this uh, uh, belief that um, if you fold a thousand paper cranes, um, your wish is granted. And of course, her wish was uh, for her own health um, and uh, for wellness for herself, but also for um, for peace in the world and for uh, Hiroshima never again. Um, and so we learned all about uh, that as children, as our parents and uh, our community there at Jonah House uh, took the bomb very personally um, and um, and uh, committed uh, to its. Uh, dismantlement uh, through um, acts of nonviolent civil disobedience um, over the years. And so uh, all of that education was very important for us uh, so that we could understand um, what uh, peace activists were doing to try and make the world I safe. wanted to go back to 2002. Um, I was in Washington, D.C. It was a peace rally just before the Iraq War. Uh, your father, Philip Berrigan, was speaking at the rally, lifelong peace activist. Uh, he spent more than 11 years in prison for his anti-war, anti-nuclear activism. Uh, he spoke uh, here in Washington. We are number one in war, and war is our number one business. We're number one in poisoning the planet with radioactive garbage. And I recently received a report from Afghanistan. We have poisoned that land with 3,000 tons of depleted uranium. These huge, these huge bombs we have manufactured, earth penetrating and rock penetrating, and we le have left it as, an F, as a legacy to that unfortunate land. We're number one in paying for war. And at last count that I came across, it's something like 20 trillion. We're number one in killing people one half million annually, resulting from our leadership of the nuclear club. One half million annually the world's people, and increasingly, as the cancer epidemic hits this country, our own people. Philip Berrigan speaking at a peace rally in 2002. He died about half a year later uh, at his home at Jonah House in Baltimore of cancer. Um, Frida, your father, your uncle, Daniel, and Philip Berrigan, uh, I don't know how many times they were arrested for civil disobedience, um, starting with the burning of the draft cards uh, in Maryland, um, burning with napalm draft cards in Vietnam. You, too, have been arrested many times. Talk about that kind of activism that you all engage in. Sure. Well, at the end of uh, that uh, speech uh, there in April of 2002, uh, my dad says, uh, don't get tired. Don't get tired.